This is an interview with Oscar Brundage at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 3rd of April, 2003, um, approximately 9.30 a.m. The interviewers are Mike Russard and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Oscar E. Brundage, uh, July the 20th, 1919, uh, born in Mechanicville, New York. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to going to uh, high school? Service? Graduated from high school. Oh, okay. Could you tell me uh, if you remember where you were and what your reaction was when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, yeah, I was watching. Uh, I was watching a football game, and uh, it didn't mean that much. Cause I didn't know anything about Pearl Harbor. Never heard of it. Mm -hmm. But then that night we played basketball up here, right downstairs here. Oh, at the and I was down to that game, and I see everybody, you know, Company L coming in in uniform and everything. Mm -hmm. We really didn't, you know, just didn't register. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, drafted or did you enlist? Well, I'll tell you, I was in 1A and uh, I wasn't called yet, but a lot of my buddies were going in. Well, I think it was in uh, April the 3rd, uh, 42. Mm -hmm. So I went down, I enlisted, but I got a draftee's number because I went with them. I figured. There was 140 some from Stillwater, Mechanicville, Waterford. I figured I'd stay with some of them anyway. Mm -hmm. Or if I was drafted, maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. Okay, did you uh, select going into the Airborne? Oh yeah, that's all volunteer. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick that? Well, I'll tell you. A, a buddy of mine uh, down in, uh, when we were interviewed down Camp Upton, they asked, he was just ahead of me, they asked him what he wanted to get into. He wanted to get in the paratroops. I never heard of it. Mm -hmm. They asked me, if, and I said I wanted to get in the Air Corps. Well, he wound up in the Air Corps, and I wound up in the paratroops. <laughs> but after uh, six weeks of uh, basic training... Mm -hmm. Where did you go for basic? Uh, Camp Upton. Upton, okay. And uh, after six weeks, then they split you up, you know, mm -hmm. in the different department. So they put me in this intelligence school there where you got to draw maps and, and uh, I can't even draw a straight line let alone make maps. So they, uh, that night, after the first night we come in, they had a notice on the bulletin board. They were on Wednesday they were giving physical exams for the paratroops. So I figured that's my best, shortest way of getting out of that what I was doing. So uh, then when I went down, then when after you signed the dotted line and everything, they asked me when I finished basic training. So I had to finish that anyway. Mm -hmm. that, that was the reason I, I didn't know about the $50 extra a month or nothing else. I just wanted to get out of what I was in. Okay, um, where did you go for your airborne training? Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that a little bit? Did you, uh, about your jump training and so on? Well, you have... Uh, well, they have three weeks that uh, it's all exercise in the morning. They did a lot of running, a lot of calisthenics, and all of that, and they uh, ventured to these uh, towers. Uh, there's a 30-foot tower you jump off and slide down a wire. Then uh, they have the free fall towers. First they, they, they take you up, first they take you up and uh, they lay you down flat on the mat that hook up the harness and they draw you up 100, 150 feet and you have a ripcord and they tell you to pull that and then change hands while you're dropping. You drop 15 feet and it catches you. Of course then if you drop it, they do it again. That's the worst part of the whole training. That there. Why, why was that? I don't know, you're, you're watching that mat get smaller all the while, you know, and of course it's the first thing you do, after, you know, to getting off of the ground. But once you get over that way, the rest is, 
this is the staff. Mm -hmm. Then the fourth week, uh, in the more in the uh, I forget now. half the day you packed a parachute. In the afternoon you packed a parachute. The next morning you jumped. Then the afternoon you pack it for the next day. You got two men pa packing a parachute together for for about take about 45 minutes for each one. Then they send guys to school riggers to learn how to do it, and they pack all alone in about seven minutes. So. That's, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. So you guys actually pack your own chutes? You pack your own, yeah, you uh, pack your own chute. Oh, I went to demolition school and we had a job. We packed our own chute for that. But after that, they had the riggers that had gone to school to learn how to, you know, pack all alone. Mm -hmm. So then we didn't have to pack them anymore then. How many jumps did you have from a plane? 20, 22 altogether. Count and combat, Joe. Uh -huh. um, what kind of planes did you jump from? C-47s. Okay. Um, now, you went to demolition school. Did you, did you go to that after jump school? Yes, yeah, so as soon as you finished, even before we got our furlough and everything, I went to jump uh, demolition school for two weeks. Where was that? It's, that's right there, Fort Benning. Right, right, it's, uh, right. it's all part of the same, mm -hmm. you know, you jump in the same area, train in the same area. Mm -hmm. What things did you learn in, in demolition school? Well, of course, I would follow us at uh, the big coal miners and uh, worked in the, the woods out west and everything. That, that That's old stuff to them. I didn't know dynamite from TNT or anything else. You know, you learn all about uh -huh. that. Uh -huh. Then uh, we had to learn how to ride a motorcycle, how to drive a truck. They had a narrow gauge railroad. You had to learn how to run the engine, things like that, in case you ever got captured and you were able to escape. I... Okay. Um, now, when were you assigned to your unit? What unit were you assigned to? The uh, when we went after we went through jump school. And I said two weeks at uh, demolition school. Then they took our whole platoon, and that became the uh, demolition platoon for the 507. The 507 was formed on my birthday, the first day of jump school, July the 20th. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, were, you, were any of the uh, ones from Mechanicville that went in with you in your unit at all, or not? No? Not a single after. After I volunteered for the paratroops, I was all alone. Mm -hmm. Now, was this the first time you were away from home? Yes. How, how did you feel about that? What? Well, I'll tell you, they, they kept you busy. I, I never, I never minded that that much, really. Mm -hmm. You know, we got a couple for a load. You know, the only time, there's only one time I ever got homesick. And that's when we are going into the bulge. They flew us over to... France, we were in England getting ready for, we were going to jump across the Thames River, practice jump across the Rhine. And uh, they flew us over, over to France. They put us in a tent. There's no heat, no lights, no nothing. And there's one guy in there, he kept saying, well, it's half past one at home now. I suppose my father's getting ready to go down to the store and get a cigar to have after dinner and everything. And, a quarter to while well, his mother's starting to put the food on the table and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I wouldn't mind shooting the guy then. <laughs> but I, that was the only time I ever really got homesick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, after, after you uh, finished your basic, uh, did you go over to Europe as a unit? Yes. To England? Yeah. Um, could you tell us about where you left and how you w went overseas? Well, we went over what? In. Uh, <clears throat> Well, after we after we got after we got through in uh, Fort Benning, uh, we went down to uh, Barksdale Field, Louisiana, maneuvers, and then we went out to uh, Alliance, Nebraska. We did most of our training out there, and uh, I think it was in uh, November. 
43 that we left from, uh, where was it, Hampshanks, New York, to go to, a, we went over to uh, Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of vessel did you travel on? What kind of ship? It was a British troop ship, mm -hmm. the HMT Strathnaver. I can still remember the name of it. Um, did you get British food on that ship? Yeah, wet rations and dry rations. Well, what did you think of the British food? Well, I tell you, if you're hungry enough, you know, you eat anything. It, mm -hmm. it wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. um, were you in a convoy or? Uh, yes. You did work. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, where did you go from Ireland? We went. Well, we were in Ireland until about uh, March. From uh, November till March. Then we went to England, mm -hmm. and that's, that's where we left from when we went uh, for D-Day. Mm -hmm. Did you do any special training in Ireland and England? Well, no, not, not special. I mean, more or less what we've been doing the same thing all the while. Mm -hmm. we, helped, we helped to blow up a golf course in uh, poor Rush, Northern Ireland. But what do you mean, blow up a golf well, course? We, well, they used, used said explosive, you know, run problems there. Mm -hmm. I, I see they're using the golf course now, so I, I guess we're all right. <laughs> okay, um, do you want to talk about your uh, preparations for D-Day? You went in uh, to France? Yeah, we, uh, well, let's see now, how do I explain? The, the thing that... One thing, everything you did was at night. Everything is top secret. Mm -hmm. Except when we went to the airport to jump for D-Day, it was in the middle of the afternoon. People out on the street waving goodbye to you and everything else. So, and we was at the airport probably for about a week. Then we went out to, uh, we are going out the one night, and then they postponed it till the next one. We had General Gavin give us a little pep talk, you know, beforehand. Had you seen much of General Gavin before this? Yeah, we trained with him a lot in Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. See, he was head of the 505, we were the 507. Because a lot of the 505, I said, I, I took those two weeks and went to demolition school. Well, a good share of the fellows that uh, I went to jump school with, they went in the 505. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you think of him? He was a good man. He was always up to the front. The one thing when we when we jumped, we had to go through. We had to wade the. Uh, we had to go through some swamp. And we had to wade across. I think it was the Douve River. He helped pull me up the bank there. There's a railroad running right through the middle of it, mm -hmm. and he was up on that, help pull people up the bank and everything. You, you swear it just come out of the tailor shop, you know. But he, he, he was one the first ones there. He was in front all the while. Could you describe when you, uh, the planes going over and your jump on D-Day itself? Well, the, you know, you went in just prior to it. Well, I'll tell you, we, uh, uh, you really couldn't see that much in the plane. Mm -hmm. So uh, the only thing you could, you could down and uh, we weren't very high going across the channel. See, they went, as soon as they hit the land, then they went up higher for the jump. Mm -hmm. But uh, you really couldn't see, even the boats, you know, it was dark, so you couldn't even see them. But they have some, they have some good pictures of guys jumping on the boats. I don't know how they got them, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I never saw any of them. Um, could you tell us then about the jump itself? Well, you know, they they put on the red light, and then you got four minutes, and you check equipment, then then the red light, and then you jump. I jumped right behind the lieutenant. This is the last time I ever saw him. And uh, then when we landed, we, we had no idea where we were. You know, they make such good preparations, big sandbox, probably as big as this room. You know, you land right here, and then you just, Assembled in the corner of this field, and you go follow this hedge road here. 
I've never seen the place yet. So, but they just had uh, where we were supposed to go, Amfreville. They just uh, the 507 just put up a monument there a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. When you landed, did you land in a field or in the trees? Or I, I couldn't ask for anything better. I landed right in the field. The guys landed in trees, landed in swamps. I landed right in the middle of the field. Now, being in demolition, did you carry any special equipment with you? Demolition? Oh uh, yeah, we, car we carried a box. I think it was uh, what twelve pounds of TNT. Then we had gammon grenades. It's a uh, it's a British. It's like putty. Uh -huh. Really powerful. We had that. We had you know. 12 pounds of TNT, we had the caps and the Primacord and detonators. Mm -hmm. What kind of weapons did you carry? And then that jump there, I, I carried a Tommy gun. Mm -hmm. But then later on I changed it and got a carbine. It was a lot lighter. Did you meet any enemy opposition when you landed? Well, there was, yes, there was. There was a... Uh, there wasn't that the more on more in the air because they didn't know where we were and we didn't know where they were. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, you know, they could see the planes, I suppose, and here. There was a lot of firing in the air, but once they got on the ground, not until it started getting daylight. They didn't really run into because we didn't run into any Germans or anything at that time. We were just waiting across the swamp. If they see the thing was the way I understand it, they knew right where we were going to land. They had everything set up for that. The only thing is, we didn't land there. So uh, they were just as confused as we were. So did your unit assemble somewhere? We didn't, uh, well, we probably had 15, 20 guys all together until we hit the, the, the railroad out of the swamp. Then there was a lot of people there. That's when uh, Gavin got everybody together. Mm -hmm. What did you do from there? We followed that. We went into uh, Chef DuPont. And then uh, there was some fighting outside of there. We set up defense right along the edge of Chef DuPont. Because they were supposed to be coming toward us. The Germans, uh, the Americans took a bridge right near there. One, one officer, he got killed there. No, he didn't get killed. He got wounded bad, but he didn't, he didn't die. But they were coming our way, and we were there all night. You know. Now, were there any glider units near you at all? Did any glider units come in? Not that I know of. Okay. They, they must have, but I, I don't know of any. Not where we were. Um, how long were you in combat at that time? Well, that was what, 6th of June? I think we come out something like the 15th of July. I think we went in with around 2,200 men, and I understand we come out with 770. Could you tell about uh, some of the hedgerow fighting? How did you feel about going through the hedgerows? And well, you know, I'll tell you something. After after I got out, I tried to forget every, everything that happened, and, and I really don't okay. remember too much about that. I mean, a couple of battles, I remember, but outside of that, you know, you go roll from go from one hedgerow to another, usually at night. Uh, they, they see that being demol demolition man, really, what we were first we were riflemen, then you're a demolition man, then you were a paratrooper. See, the paratroops is just a way of getting you where they wanted you to go. But I mean, uh, and the demolition was just, uh, if they needed something like that, I mean, you were trained in that. But mainly you were riflemen. And we were with the uh, we were with the battalion headquarters most of the while. And when you went back to England, how long were you in England? Well, we went back, let's see, 
Well, I said that that was about in the middle of July, and we were there until uh, they flew us over for the bulge. Uh -huh. What were your relationships like with the English people? Oh, well, we got along good with them. We're not. I don't remember any trouble uh -huh. with any uh -huh. of them. We were just we were stationed just outside of Nottingham. Of course, we didn't see the sheriff or nothing, but uh, <laughs> or Robin Hood. But. Um, <clears throat> what, you uh, were training for jumps in the Rhine when they called you over for the the bulge. Do it for the bulge. We didn't jump. We didn't jump in the bulge. Okay. Well, how were you taking over for that? But uh, what's that? How were you taking over? Now, did you hear what? the news of what was happening? Oh yeah, we knew everything that was going on. They f see, I said we were at the, uh, we were at an airport, ready to jump across the Thames River, mm -hmm. and uh, then they called us back to camp because of the bulge. Then they got us ready, and they flew us over to France, mm -hmm. right, right near the Belgian border. Now, did you have winter equipment, w winter gear? No. Not too much. We had we got heavy overcoat, but uh, you know, not not too much. We didn't have any uh, overshoes or nothing like that. You just had your jump boots. Yeah. Uh, How about your gloves and some? What were your gloves like? Oh, no, we had well, I think they were woolen gloves. You know, not not the real heavy ones. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything with them anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, could you tell what happened after you landed in France? How did they get you to the front? We were, after we landed there, we were in France for probably four or five days. Then they drove us up in trucks. Um, what, could you talk about the bulge and, and what it was like when you got there? Well, when we got there, it really wasn't too bad, but then it snowed and got real cold. And uh, yeah, the first the first day of action, we had to wait through about a foot and a half of snow, take a hill where the Germans had pulled out, but they had that all zeroed in. So as soon as we got up there, they started shelling. Mm -hmm. And I think the communication section lost 22 out of 28 men, right there. And uh, of course, you got a lot of tree burrs and all of that. Then we pulled down on the side hill, dug in, and then uh, about three o'clock in the morning they came and got us. And we pulled out. Um, were you pretty well supplied with food and, and ammunition and so on? Oh yeah, well, I'm, I'm personally I never lacked for any, uh -huh. you know, ammunition or food. Of course, going into Normandy, we carried a lot of the sea rations with us. Uh -huh. uh, Did you suffer from uh, frostbite at all? No. no. Of course, I had my I had my ears froze when I was a kid, mm -hmm. and I had my fingers frostbitten when I was a kid. So you know, the the cold bothered me some, but uh, that was all. How long were you in combat in the bulge? I would say probably around a month. I don't know exactly. And then they flew us back to uh, they flew us back to England, and uh, then they got ready for the jump across the Rhine. Okay, this was Operation Varsity. That was the Rhine jump. Uh -huh. You participated in that. Yep. Could you tell us about that a little bit, or? Well, we no, did. Where, where were you wounded? Where? Yeah, and when? In Normandy was one. I was on guard duty outside of a dugout, and we heard shells coming in, and I couldn't even find the entrance of the dugout. And the shell went off. I was carrying my rifle, and I got a chunk about that wide and about that long taken out of the stock of my rifle. And I got hit in the shoulder. And, uh, of course, that spun me around. I had the whole side of my face scraped and everything. But I went over the medics, they got the shrapnel out. A couple little pieces still in there, but not. Uh, let's see. Then, uh, well, 
where well, I was really lucky, we had to go out after a sniper. And when had, was this? Uh, this was in Normandy, uh -huh. about the middle of June somewhere. And I was a corporal, so I was leading. And had three on our side of the road, two on the other. We're spread out. And we went about 100 yards, and two mortar shells landed right in the, right in the guy behind me. I didn't hear the second one. But uh, the two on the other side of the road got wounded bad enough, they were evacuated. The guy behind him, same thing. He got killed. I had a piece of shrapnel come up, right along, right along my, burn along my neck, and hit, went right through my uh, wool liner that I had, and knocked my helmet off, took a chunk out of that. And uh, I couldn't hear for half an hour or so, but later on I could, except I found out later. I'm deaf in my right ear from that. So I get, I get a pension for that now, but the thing is, there was no medics, I couldn't prove anything. But I wrote a letter to my wife around the 1st of August. Oh, so you were married when you went into service? Yeah, I, I got married while I was in the service. Oh, okay. And uh, I, let, I wrote a letter to my wife, and I explained everything that happened there when I got that through there. But I didn't tell her that I was deaf. But uh, they told me when I went back to work that I was deaf in that. So uh, I applied for pension, was turned down because I had no proof. And that went long about four or five years ago. I, looked, I had a lot of stuff down cellar when we had the flood here in 48, 49. Everything was down cellar, most of it got ruined. But she had a, the scrapbook and uh, I got it out one day, we were looking at it. And I went right on past it, so she opened up this envelope, and I had she had this letter from me, and explained just the way I wrote to the when I was for, trying to get my uh, pension compensation, but uh, just the way I explained it was in that letter. So I brought it up to Boston, and uh, they made a photo stat, sent it in, and then uh, a couple months later, I got a notice from uh, the Legion. That, they were at the hearing, and the, the, it was favorable. So I started getting the pension from that. So I got a hearing aid and everything for it now. Now you mentioned uh, in this form you filled out that uh, one of your best remembrances happened in Belgium or Luxembourg when a German plane came in. Could you tell us about that? No, it wasn't a German plane. It was a... Uh, uh, Oh, I, I know what, uh, oh, this, this, I thought you were talking about something else. Yeah, I know that. And we were on guard duty. And uh, I had the whole, I had the whole uh, platoon then. So anyway, I was with him. This one guy, he was a newcomer, you know. So uh, anyway, we're putting guys out. German planes come over and started strafing. So actually we all got someplace where we get out of the way. So after they left, I went out, he was still standing there. So I asked him where he went. He said, no, he was right there. I said, why didn't you go hide? He said, well, they weren't shooting at me. <laughs> so... Yeah. Now you said that uh, someone helped you out of a burning building? Could yeah, that was in the bulge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we went out. This lieutenant... We were supposed to mine a bridge. There was two small towns with a stream between them and a bridge across them. And we were supposed to go out and mine that. But then they told us, under no circumstances could we blow it. But I don't, so I don't know why they weren't mine. Anyway, we went out and we found out it was already blown. So we went, we, uh, they put us in a house, we stayed there. And then the Germans started shelling and they got hit with a smoke grenade and got caught on fire. And uh, so I helped all the rest of the guys find the doorway to get out and everything. And uh, then I couldn't find the doorway. This buddy of mine, he lives in Oswego. I see him now. What was uh, his name? Uh, Bob Oxenbein. Uh -huh. And uh, he was the one that helped me find the door to get out. Uh, um, after Operation uh, Varsity, where did you go from there? 
We'll see now. Well, we're, we were there for a while. They both said, did you have much opposition to that landing? Yes, it was a lot of firing, yes. Yeah. But then they pulled us, when that straight down, we went down around the Ruhr Valley, down in Essen, mm -hmm. to help clean up the Ruhr Valley. And then after, well, we were outside, I think we were there when the war ended. Did you uh, stay in Germany for any occupation duty at all? No, no, never. Well, I was doing the balls. That's the only time while well, we were doing across the ride. That's all I saw in Germany there. Yeah, you know, a lot of it, they didn't have enough points. See, I had, I was wounded twice, so there was 10 points there, and I was married, had a son and everything. So I had enough points to come home. But I know a lot, a lot of them there that, you know, they went over to Germany, German of occupation. What did you, um, what was your feeling when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Do you recall? No, 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 we were, I know where we were, we were a town called Bottrop, we were, you know, just, uh, we were going into combat there to clean out the town and everything, so we didn't worry too much about it then. Uh -huh. I was worried more about me right then. Yes. Because we know, you know, we know we're getting near the end of the war, and, you know, you're kind of anxious to get home. How did you feel when you heard about the end of the, the surrender of Germany? Well, we had a big party that night. Well, we had a big party when we heard about Hiroshima, too. Why? Just celebrating. Mm -hmm. Now, where were you when you heard about Hiroshima? Uh, let's see now. Where were we? Well, we were in Essen. Yeah. Were you aware of the German concentration camps at all? Not, not a bit. Not a bit. Except... Later on, you know, read it in the Stars and Stripes, you know, and then, uh, of course, they didn't have television then. We heard that about it on the radio. But I never saw any uh, indication of anything like that at all, never. When were you discharged and where were you discharged? It was September 23rd from uh, Camp Dix. We landed at Miles Standish when we came back. Then from there we went to Dix. About a week later we got discharged. Now was this, when you went home, was this the first time you saw your son? Or? Oh yes, yeah. Yeah, I was, over, I was overseas. Of course, he was born six weeks early. And uh, I, I didn't find out about it for a long time because... Uh, they sent the, the cablegram to the wrong place, so eventually I did. Mm -hmm. um, did you uh, make use of the GI Bill when you returned? No, no. Did you ever use the 5220 Club? For a short time, just a short time. We got, let's see, we came back, well, it was in, I got discharged. It's, 20, I think it was the 25th or 23rd of September, and uh, I took the week or the month of October off, and I went back to work again right beginning of November. Did you join any veterans organizations ever? Have you yeah, ever joined Legion. Belong to the Legion. Mm -hmm. I belong to the Military Order of Purple Heart. Have you kept in contact, uh, you did say you did, but have you kept in contact with uh, many of the those you served with? Yes, uh, of course, most, see, in my age now, most of them are dead. Mm -hmm. Now, when we started, I didn't go to any reunions until I retired. That was 18 years ago. And uh, at that time, there was 12 of us that I was with in the service, you know, their wives. There was other guys there that I was with before, but I mean, the special ones, and uh, their wives. Now, two years ago, the last one we went to, there was only one other couple besides us out of them. And that's that one I told you about to help me out of the burning house. He lives in Oswego. So I mean, well, last fall we met him. And um, shortly we're going out there again. You heard the Turning Stone Casino? Yes. Well, they... Uh, he drives down from Oswego and I drive out from here. It takes him about an hour, me two hours. And we meet out there, but 
9.30 in the morning, leave about 3. So, you know, we have good share of the day together. His wife with him and my wife. So, yeah, I've been out to his house four or five times. He's been to my house a couple times, even before he was married, so. Did you uh, ever see any USO shows while you were... I saw one, and I'm trying to think who in the heck it was now. The only one, that's all, in England. How do you think uh, your military service affected or changed your life in any way? Well, uh, you know, a lot of different ways. Of course, I was, there's one thing, I was always a fussy eater. But there's one, I learned to eat almost everything except uh, liver. I can't stand that. And when we took our 50th wedding anniversary, we went over to England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, and I even tried that Scottish haggis. And if you can eat that, you can eat anything. <laughs> but, so you have gone over back over to see some of the places you were? Or, no, not... Or you just went on a trip? You know, just, just for a trip. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I did see some of the things we saw before, like in England, I saw Stonehenge, and uh -huh. we saw London, I got in there a couple of times, and church at Winchester, Winchester Cathedral, uh -huh. and uh, of course with Scotland, I could see, I went to Scott, a buddy of mine that lives in uh, Michigan, he was born in Glasgow, so we got a week's furlough after we came out of after D-Day, and I went up to Scotland with him. So on our trip, I, I saw Glasgow in the distance, but I never got in there. How about just show, holding this up, uh, Wayne can zoom in on it, and tell us where that photograph was taken and when. Uh, yeah, that, I think that, it's written on the back. Uh, yeah, I know, it was taken in Alliance, Nebraska, in the summer of 1943. Okay, got it. All right, well, thank you very much for your interview, sir. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, I thank you.